no, no, for me. Yeah. Well. Thank you for thank you for being here. Sure. Yes. Okay. Let's let's start um, talking. Uh, sometimes we do these interviews on on Instagram with a lot of people asking questions, and and today will be different because it's on Zoom, and I will repost it on YouTube and Facebook later. Uh, okay. All, all edited so everyone can see it again and watch it and rewatch it again, and we'll answer a lot of things because I, if if your if your team on Instagram remembers, I'm a big uh, defender of the burp since yeah. a long time ago not just from now <laughs> and i have a lot of discussions about that because some people is not because they don't understand how burp should work and that's right. why it's so good to have you here because for me it it probably saved my career wow. the burp. It brought me yeah. back to playing when i lost my playing so uh, let's talk about that and it was really important so do you want to tell us first who are you where you are from and now you did start on the music first of all okay so um i was born here in uh the san francisco bay area in uh, berkeley and uh and my parents my father was a barber my grandfather was born in sicily um oh, and that's my, your name yeah and my uh my grandmother was also born in sicily um so i have deep sicilian roots but yes. not too deep so that i don't get into trouble right so <laughs> yeah. so uh but my father so he was a barber but he played banjo and guitar my mother played concert piano so there was a lot of music in the tradition of uh, everybody in the family played something you know mandolin or whatever and we sang a lot so i had a lot of music and I found, uh, I went to my aunt's basement one day and I found a cornet and uh, I picked it up and I figured out how to make a sound. I don't know how. And started picking out tunes and my uncle would say, play so-and-so and I'd try to figure out. So I did it all on my own. And then, and then I was lucky enough to have these supportive parents and you know how important that is. And they said, well, we have to get you a teacher. And they went to the music store and they asked around and this guy said, yes, you should study with so-and-so. So I had this incredible first teacher. Uh, his name was Eddie Smith. And he actually played with Earl Father Hines in, um, in his band. He was actually the only white guy in the band. And he was a terrific player and an amazing teacher who had me doing, playing out of the Arbenz book and Clark but also uh, in those days, we're talking about, you know, I was born in 1942. Uh, so I'm, you know, I go back to the dark ages, but in those days, there was only one 78 recording record that had blues and B flat on one side and blues and F on the other side. And he had me playing along with these records, this record, one record. And he would just say, listen, listen, listen. Awesome. And um, that's the way we did it, you know? And then I, he had me transcribing Bunny Berrigan and a few Louis solos. And this was my first teacher, you know, it was amazing. So I give him a lot of credit and I talk about him with a lot of respect because um, if we were all so lucky, you know, to have that. But he, he stressed uh, every part of, of trumpet playing. We would talk about uh, all sorts of things that I didn't think had any relationship, but it was about your brain being connected to what you were doing and playing. And he said that, um, he said, you know, you want to be a musician who plays trumpet. And that's really what I try to describe myself as. Um, uh, I was able to make a living and join the union when I was 13 and I started playing in bands. Um, and working on the weekends and helping my folks out. And uh, so he took me, he said after three years, he said he couldn't teach me as well as his teacher could. So he took me to his teacher, who was an old uh, German fellow who played violin and cornet, which was a tradition, 
you know? Yes. And uh, he was tough, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, I would play and if my fingers, if I wasn't like that, you know, he'd give me a little whack. And my mother would come to all my lessons and sit in the back and take notes. This was like, you know, the support beyond support. And so one day she said, yeah. uh, Mr. Ottoman, you never say anything good about Mario. Is he doing okay? You know, and, and Mr. Ottoman said, we don't have time for that. He's fine, but we have work to do. You know, that was his attitude. Anyhow, so I, yeah, which, go. yeah which was very good for me for all my life because, um, even when I studied with Vacchiano in New York uh, at Juilliard, uh, he was a tough teacher. He was, uh, his method was not like mine. You know, his was, I'm going to basically tell you, you can't do anything. And then you'll listen to me and then I'll tell you how to do it the right way. So he would just keep poking around until I screwed something up. And then he would say, see, I told you, you can't do that. And I'd say, okay. And so, you know, so, but I learned yeah. and later on, of course, we were colleagues and he said, oh, just call me Bill. And you, I knew you were going to be successful because, you know, you did everything very well, blah, blah, blah. So that my teaching thing was great. I also studied with Jimmy Stamp uh, yes. when I was in Los Angeles. And that was a big part of, of course, the burp and the and how that all came I was about. To, I, I, will about, I will talk about that exactly. exactly. Yes. And it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I studied with Jimmy twice. Uh, when I was in college, I studied a little bit with him, but I wasn't, you know, at that age, I thought I knew everything. I was doing okay, you know, and I, I mean, I wasn't cocky, but I, I felt like, okay. So I studied with two teachers at there. And the other one was a great, uh, uh, Les Remsen, a great, um, um, uh, he was in the LA Philharmonic uh, back in the forties. It's a great player. And, and so then, um, so I, let, I, I got a little bit of buzzing then, but I wasn't really into it. And then I went to uh, uh, Juilliard. And then uh, when I came back, I got the job in the LA Philharmonic when I got out of uh, uh, Juilliard in 66, 1966. Straight away from Juilliard Straight. to the LA Philharmonic. Yeah, I was, you know, those days, <laughs> you know, it wasn't so, it wasn't like, thousands of people showing up for auditions. I mean, um, when I was in New York, I was playing uh, Radio City Music Hall, uh, American Ballet, Extra. Yes, um, yeah. Vacchiano got me on one week with the New York Philharmonic, which was like, you know, like going from the Little Leagues to the New York Yankees. It was like, whoa. But, um, and then I was playing salsa bands after hours with Lou Soloff and some great players in New York. So. I was jiggling a lot of things, trying to find my voice, you know, and see what I was going to do. And uh, I had done some uh, work with some groups in uh, Los uh, in Tahoe, which was like a Las Vegas kind of lounge act. Yes. And I was playing behind them. And man, that was hard work, right? It was, it was like boom, 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 at one hour straight, play hard. And I thought, wow. And it was in midnight in the morning to three in the morning. And my dad said, you know, are you going to be a teacher? Are you going to be a player like here? Or what are you going to do? And so uh, then I started thinking more about being in an orchestra. So um, my friend, Tom Stevens, was in the LA Philharmonic and uh, a couple other friends, Roger Bobo, the tuba player, um, Miles Anderson, the trombone player, and they were all there and they said, you should, we're going to have an opening. So I auditioned when they had an opening and it was a great bunch of players that I auditioned with. I mean, these were friends of mine from Los Angeles, Ronnie Rom, Tony Plogue, uh, Malcolm McNabb. Wow. Yeah. These were all guys that they auditioned. Right. And, um, Tony, Tony was with me. Well, a few, a few weeks ago and we were together teaching in a conference in Croatia as well. Great oh time. really? Yeah, Great he's time. wonderful. Yeah, he yeah. used to play extra with us in the LA Phil. Uh, I love him. Yeah, he's 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 a dear friend, and 
he taught at the music academy in Santa Barbara before I before I taught there. So anyhow, so we all played, you know, and uh, in those days, no preliminary tape. You just show up at the day, and we all knew each other, and you walked out. And uh, I had asked my friends, you know, like Roger, should I try to play? You know, what is Zubin like to hear? Here? And everybody said, just play the way you play, and you. And that's always been my philosophy. You know, I don't try to try to do something different because it's not going to come out very well. Yeah. So, uh, so I I went ahead and I played, and uh, I <laughs> Zubin Mehta, who you know was a great conductor, but he didn't know too much about the playing of instruments. Frankly, you know, he was one of those conductors who had the big picture, but so he he would ask for some things, and sometimes he didn't really know so i i remember playing pines and a few things that i really felt good about and then uh he said to the first trumpet at the time he said well i want to hear zarathustra and uh and the, the first trumpet player was a really nice guy and he turned to me and he said do you want to play zarathustra at the call and i said no and he said Okay, so he turned around to do me and said, we don't have the music for that. You can't play that right now. <laughs> wow. Old times. <laughs> you know, who would ever do that these days, right? It would never happen. Anyhow, as it turned out, I had a good day. And the other guys, Ronnie Rom, who was a friend of mine, continues to be a friend of mine, was in New York the year before visiting. And we hung out. We had lunch or something. And he said, you know, there's going to be an opening in L.A. And I've been playing extra with him. I'm going to get that job. I said, oh, great, Ronnie. You know, I was in New York. I don't know what I was going to do. So there we were at the audition at the same time. And for whatever reason, I got the job. He didn't. But then he got Canadian brass, right? So exactly. every time I saw him after that, I said, okay, I got the job, but you made all the money, right? You know? <laughs> well, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, but, it, you know, in those, that was very, very great experience. And then that orchestra, of course, took off with Zoom and we did a lot of world tours and, and recordings. And uh, we had the LA Brass Quintet, which just released a bunch of re, I don't know if you've heard them, but I can uh, I can send you a copy of this. Uh, some of the stuff we did early has been re-released on CDs and stuff. Yes, so, yeah, okay, it's a, I, I think it's really great playing. It was, you know, that was a great band. We were, we worked hard in those days, the orchestras were busy, but I felt personally that I wanted to have more of a voice in other kinds of music just besides playing second or third trumpet in the orchestra. Yes. So the quintet was the great outlet for that. Um, so here's what happened. So then I'm into the orchestra playing and it's 75, 76 maybe. And I, suddenly I changed mouthpieces and I went from a Bach to a Bush mouthpiece, and all of a sudden, I I, I couldn't keep the horn on my face. It kept sliding off my face. So That's everybody said, "Yeah." Me. So so everybody said, "Well, you got to go see Stamp again." So that's when I went to see Jimmy, and I really spent you know a couple of times a week with him for maybe a year or two, and basically he put my face back together he created a, a, a an embouchure and a face for me and that's when i really started to understand his concept of, of buzzing and where it came from and um you know everybody in los angeles was seeing him not just trumpet players uh, oh, yeah. brass players yeah yeah brass players because he he uh he made it simple but he wouldn't let you get past the point, uh, you know, if he didn't think you got it up to that point, he would not let you go beyond it. Sometimes we would just work on, you know, just poo attack, keep yes. the lips together, let the air go through the lips, blah, 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 you know, so he would, he would stop you. And I think what I learned a lot from Jimmy, not only all of this technical stuff, but the idea that it's when you get result oriented, when you think about what you want to do and what in, you know, if you get outside of yourself a little bit too much, that's when we get into trouble because we have a lot of 
old uh, survival techniques and things that we do to get notes to come out. And we all do it. And no matter where you are in your career, right? You warm up and you get all ready and then you're in the moment. And sometimes you just got to go for it and you have to do something. But if those bad habits kick in to the all the time, then you're in trouble. Yes. So, so I think I learned there and I've developed uh, with my students, I, I talk a lot about that, about don't, don't be result oriented, be in the moment and do, do your basics, do your, uh, remember the things that we want to habituate, to make into habits, to make things that are, um, that are positive and uh, uh, foundational. And so that's really where I focus with Jimmy's stuff. And I think I took, you know, when I worked with Jimmy, uh, one of the things that he would have us do, of course, was at the time, he would have us, you know, buzz in the mouthpiece with the two fingers and all that stuff that, the, the, that he required. And sometimes he would have us hold a finger over the end of it to create a little resistance, or we'd put a little, what they called these electrical uh, alligator clips, you'd yes. put it over over the ends, you know, you've probably seen those. So anyhow, but then he would have you hold the horn in the other hand, right? So, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So I, I thought, and a student of mine actually came back from Europe at that very time. And somebody had made a kind of a crude setup where you could put the mouthpiece into the horn, blah, blah, blah. So I want to say that, that that little crude model was that along with my work with Jimmy was the was kind of where the burp came from. Okay. Right. And it was after he died, not until after he died, just shortly after that, that I created the burp. And uh, it was basically for my students. I I wanted I wanted them to have this action this ability to hold the instrument in the way that we all hold it because it's always different right and the way you put it on your face and that's different than this yes so you I know like that's why i like it yes. yeah it's 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 a reality right and so you can see with a student when they put it on their face they do the way they play and then you can fix things yes. and and there is a lot of muscle memory and tonal memory in your fingers. So if you do, you know, if you're doing those intervals there, it should be on the horn. Because you you already you pulled back the covers to see what was going on here. Uh, the, for me, the burp is like x-ray hearing. It's like being able to go into yes. the production. Uh, yes. And for people who I talk to thousands of people at clinics and things, you know, well, why, I just practice. Why do you need to do that? You know, well, maybe you don't need to do it, but if, if you're like me and don't, I love to play, but I don't necessarily love to spend three hours and get nowhere, you know, like, I was like, is there any, there's no heroes in the, in the practice room, you know, we, we, we need to be as efficient as we can, I think. Uh, and in all the playing that I did with the Philharmonic and then in the studio work, especially, because uh, you'd walk into the, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, you sit down and somebody puts a bunch of music in front of you. So there is no time to say, well, I hope I, you know, it's not like you can pray and go, I hope I have a good day today. You know, exactly. It's too, it's too late for that, you know? And I've always said that the trumpet playing is not a religion, you know, and this is nothing against religion, but I mean, I'm just saying we need to know what we're doing and how we do it. We need to and be ready. then forget, them. yeah. And then forget about it. When you play, you play and you make music but uh and it's like you know all the great sports people that we watch right they they work they break things down they analyze they understand they work on it they drill and then when they play the game that's the game you know it's it's a whole different thing so 
that's my basic approach and 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 uh, thing about about using the burp. And I start and and just to just to finish up, I know I've been talking a lot, but no, 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 no. That's why that's why you are here. Keep it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. So so I think the part that Jimmy taught that is kind of I don't want to say underappreciated, but it. People don't talk about it as much, and it's about the breathing and the setup of the face that he that he talked about. You know, everybody does the little buzzing exercise and they do the routines. Not too often is it done correctly, you know, with with the right uh, approach. Um, but his breathing thing um, that combined when I was in New York, I, I worked with Vince Penzarella. Um, you know, New York Philharmonic and Vince and I were doing uh, Radio City Music Hall together. So what a great section, Lou Soloff, Vince Penzarella and myself. Uh, and I can't remember who else was, it was another great player down there. So we would have these in between shows at Radio City, you had to just sit around and we'd talk. And Vince had studied with Jacobs in Chicago and, uh, uh, you know, with uh, Herseth and, and, and uh, uh, a couple other people anyhow. So he had that whole approach. So we talked about breathing with him. I talked about breathing with him. And Stamp was, if you look at carefully at the, at the, uh, at his method in the book that Tom put together of his stuff, uh, you know, that exercise where you, where you take the breath, you, you let your, uh, everything out, all the air out, and you put your head between your knees, yes. and you come up and you take the breath. Do you do that every day? Does everybody do that? Probably not. But not are every you, day, but I do it sometimes. I yes, like it. it's a, it's the best reminder because when you do that, you go down, you come up, and you're set, and you're it, it, everything's open, right? And mm -hmm. and you've engaged your core to hold the breath in, and that's critical that we don't always do. So I I have a whole bunch of breathing exercises I do with students to make sure that they can, for instance, they can take a breath, one, two, three, four, that they can do that. Because then the breath isn't controlling them, they're controlling the breath, and the breath is the, is the sound. And so uh, sometimes we never get the, case, the trumpet out of the case because the breathing is so, uh messed up you know <laughs> and when the breathing's messed up all sorts of bad stuff happens so uh and and you can't you can't dial it in you can't just say okay i learned how to breathe you know i've had students where i've given them you know i have this little thing called the breath awareness tool i wrap put around your waist you know to just keep them aware of, of the expansion and holding and they uh, and they'll do it for a week, and they'll say, "Okay, I got it." And I go, "Yeah, really? Uh, I don't think so." But play this, and I'll pull out a chalet or something. And as soon as they are into playing the music, nothing. The breath is gone. The horns going into their teeth, and <laughs> and the sound is <sighs> right. So it's uh, you can't get ahead of yourself. You. you if you want to be efficient and really productive, you need to make that habit every time. And Stamp used to say that. And if you read carefully, he says, take a breath, bring the lips together, the hup breath. There you are. <clears throat> and before you put the mouthpiece, any pressure is, a lot, is, is uh, the quote is, before any pressure is added to the embouchure, the lips must be together. And the breath must be taken. So, you know, he didn't talk about the no pressure system or anything else, but he just said that's what you have to do. And if you do that, and then you add everything beyond that, you know, like you add. So I did, and he and he had the free buzz thing going right too. Yes, I imagine you you probably do a little bit of that. Yeah. Well, I want to get to that point with you trying okay. to understand some things because that was one of the problems that damaged my ambusher uh, ah. because I done it wrong 
and I feel a lot of my students are doing it wrong as well now. So, so how did that happen? I mean, so uh, I stopped. I, I was a professional player, high level in Portugal, and I've, I've been in the army band for five years. Uh, and then I've been a homeless for three years when I left the army. So I didn't play at all for, for that three years that I've been a homeless. And then I moved to England. I've been another year and a half without playing. So let's say four years and a half without playing. When I came back, I thought it was like, play, uh, do you know when you cycle? We say cycling is for all life, isn't it? When you know it, you know it. It's not. So I bought a trumpet and I, I thought, ah, now I know how to play high. I know how to play loud. So yeah, I started right. straight straight away because I was a professional before and my amber show was not ready. So mm -hmm. I started with stamp because I loved it. We use it a lot in Portugal, but wrong. And we're going to get there. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, and I saw a lot of your videos talking about this uh, on internet. Is one video that you are doing uh, like a masterclass with another guy, like an interview on the same room about the yes, bird yes. and the bat. And yeah. And, yeah. So I used to do the the free buzzing, but I done it so much, and my ambusher, my face was so fragile at the time, was not formed at all, so I had no muscles. That my bottom lip started rolling to the top of the the bottom teeth. Like ah. this, and when I went, when I was going up, I was doing. Uh -huh. Yes. And yes. so I developed a cyst, a big cyst on my ah. on my lip, and my lip suddenly stopped, my stopped totally. So I I thought I lost my career. This is the time now again, and wow. that's when I got a burp. Ah, okay. <laughs> But okay. but that's when I got a burp and when I went to see, but what is the stamp method? What is the idea? And I found your videos. I got a burp and I started just doing this on the, just with the burp, not with the trumpet. Right. So just getting close, just blowing. Mm -hmm. To create that first impact of the, as soon as the mouthpiece touches here, it starts vibrating and it's, it took me one month and a half on the burp, just on the burp, to take my vibration back. And then, yes, started um, properly understanding right. more. And you said something that I want to ask you, because yeah. I see everyone in Portugal. The burp is really famous in Portugal. And I'm talking about when I was in the army, everyone used it already. Yeah. And I had one. But the funny thing is, here in England, we suppose that here is a... Is a a first world country, even better than Portugal. Everyone should know it. Weird. Everyone asks me what what my burp is. Well, actually, <laughs> I had to give I had to give mine. I told you, I had to give mine to a friend that is a professional. They they don't know what, what is the burp. Some people does, but not a lot. Uh, and everyone does the stump. Everyone does the stump. When you get to any band room, people is there. Ta yeah yeah ta yeah and they do this ta yeah 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 they they don't use the, the line and you said something about stump wanted that notes in tune that that is the idea of that line yeah. do you want to explain yeah. that exercise because i think it's really important because stump is probably the method that most people use uh without arban of course arban as well but Right, right. Explain yes. the concept, the real concept of stump on that. Yes. Well, just to back up one little thing, I want to, and then I'll I'll do that because I, I you <laughs> talked about the, the free buzz, and and how this this went away for you the lower lip, and when I was going through this embouchure change and work, I worked with a lot of the great brass players, and I had one person who told me, uh, he said, well, you don't have your lower lip against your lower teeth is not happening at all. And he said, think of it as like a, a in baseball, a catcher's mitt so that you you grab with that lower lip and you're gonna be able to catch a ball that somebody throws with you like that, like grab it. Right? So when you do that, you activate this whole muscle. Yes. And then this keeps it nice and flat and it keeps it uh, against the teeth. Um, and yes. so yes. I've always used that. And then he said, and then when you bring the mouthpiece up, you make that same connection with the lower part of the mouthpiece and the lower lip. So, you know, so. So I, I can have the mouthpiece on the lower lip 
buzzing, right? And then rotate. Exactly. Right? So this is, and so that I, that's the way I work students. And if they, everybody, I ask if you do free buzzing and they say yes. And then they show me what they do and it's not, it's not right. It's like, whatever. Exactly. It, it, so, it, it, you know, the free buzzing is, is the absolute part of the foundation for the embouchure. It's not a separate thing. It is part of playing. So every time you pick up the horn and you're going to play that you have to get in that same position. So that's just to, to verify it. And a lot of times I have students just lay the horn on top of the free buzz, right? So. And then take that, it off. That, that's, what I was, that's what I started doing. Exactly. Yeah. Because well, with then, the first. Then you're proving it. Then you're then you're really establishing it. Okay, yeah. so then the stamp, the whole stamp thing about centers. Okay, um, uh, and the design of every exercise that he does, there's a purpose to it, you know, and and um, that particular one that you're talking about, the downward one. Uh, the idea is that the upper note in that figure is something that just comes out of the principal note. It's not a note you have to make. If you play the note before it correctly, that note is there already. And I like to teach it. I try to tell my students, the note you're going to is inside the note you're playing right now. Okay, so. I can trill that note really easily because I'm playing very strongly in the middle of the C, right? And then to reinforce that, he said he uses the bend, right? And the bend does the same thing by making what? I have to teach my students all the time. What is it doing? And people say, oh, it's relaxing your lip. No, no, no. It's making the air go faster. Yes. It's, it's, it's focusing the, the, the stream. So. When I do that bend, and then I don't only do it, but you hold on to the energy that you create in the bend, and you bring it back to the, the note you're playing, and then the D is boom, right there. In fact, I, I make a whole exercise, kind of an extension of that concept by doing bends and doing intervals out of bends, right? right. So if you do, you know, I... You know, so those suddenly that interval becomes closer and closer. Closer. That makes sense because you use you use that bending uh, pressure, the the energy that you are putting there to. Yeah. To just Hoken, awesome. Hoken Hardenberger talks about Hoken talks about uh, thinking of the of that bend as a rebound off of like a diving board. You know, like like so you're bouncing, you're getting in there and then boom, and then boom, it just shoots yes. you into that that next note. And, and so if you do the stamp that way, then every, then everything logically comes out of that, you know, the range and, and he uses the pedal notes the same way, right? So when people play pedals and they don't do any, I, I, I can't believe, why do you bother to play a pedal note if you're not, if you're not gonna do it right and use it as a way to understand the energy you need to play the notes you know exactly so so you have to um as soon as you get into the pedal register you know jimmy used to say the note you start at no matter how high you go wherever you go you have to match those beginning and ending notes. They have to sound with the same resonance. They have to have the same yes. energy to them. If they do, that means you you use the air to go wherever you were going to go, and you come back down. And that is such a great habit. 
right? So that, you know, it turns your head around. You know, when you have something, uh, something that you're gonna play and it's an ascending figure, if you're worried about where you're going instead of staying focused on where you are, you're gonna be in trouble. Yes, you know? well, always. And that's one of you the know. biggest problems every time, yes. Of everyone. course, and it gets yes. everybody into results. Like, you know, oh, I've got to make, I got to, you know, like, you know, even if it's a, a tune, like. <laughs> you know, say I'm, I'm playing that tune. Uh, I'm still thinking that bottom note all the way up. I'm, I'm yes. staying right, right on it, you know. And this. Exactly. Uh, this is the strength of your um, uh, your mind strength, you know. That's why I like to do some meditation. I like to do some things uh, where I, I I do focus, and I I think as trauma players we don't even realize how meditative and how strong uh, how much we use that when we play well, you know. How do you can close out those other things around you? Like people will say, well, how do you deal with nerves? How do you do? Well, if you're playing focus, you're, you should be in a different place. You shouldn't be as, of course, we all get nervous, but you should be able to stay right there, you know? Yes. And it really helps uh, when you have those moments like that. Yes. But if you, I could go through the, all the stamp stuff, like the interval uh, studies where you, where you do the, the jumps, like a, Right. right you know like that those same same principles that you make the connection with the with the crescendo and a lot of times the crescendo is not even noticeable you know he said crescendo but what he really meant was keep the air going well you know yeah. efficiently and fast and, it's and pulling and, the air in it that's yeah, why exactly. it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's why he writes those things in. So, yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah it's, it's timeless. And my poor family, I'm sure people around you know this too. I mean, all my kids and now my wife, they can sing my warm up, you know, because I do it every day, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, like my son will say, Dad, are you still doing that? Da, 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 da. Are you still doing that? And you know, I said, Yeah. Why do you do that every day? I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my kids my kids know it too <laughs> so right. that's normal and and i think they will when i die they will remember it <laughs> so that's <laughs> right. good let, let me ask you something mario um the, is the only doubt that i had about about the burp the the black one because then you have the the metal one right the right. classic yeah uh, let's talk about the black one so the lead pipe of the trumpet that that's right. where it fits and it screws right um uh holding that will not take some resonance of the of the lead pipe of the trumpet will will that not make it heavier uh, the sound well, heavier as when you put some like heavy cup or something i you know people with people have asked me about that i personally um i can't feel it but logically it should do but but it doesn't that's why i'm asking because some students asked me that. That's why I'm asking you. Right, right, right. I don't think I don't think it changes anything. Honestly. I don't think so. In fact, I have heard, and of course, I like to hear this. Somebody said, "Well, actually, I think it helps you center the sound." <laughs> you know. Well, exactly. Like, you know, it's like That's if anything, it's 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 something that I said. Well, maybe, but you know, I look. I keep mine on all the time. I of course, a lot of people take it off when they go to perform, whatever. Uh, on the other hand, when I was in the studios and in orchestras, I oftentimes, I have famously uh, was playing in the LA, uh, San Francisco Opera. I played principal for a while in that orchestra when I came up here to San Francisco. And uh, I remember one time I had an entrance coming up and I, and I played it quietly. The orchestra was playing something else and I was just buzzing it quietly on my burp, right? Of course, the classic story i forgot to take it out of the burp the, the entrance came up conductor gave me the cue and it, the buzz came out 
<laughs> I was buzzing it instead of playing it. And, and of course, the rest of the guys in the brass section thought that was really very funny. Uh, the conductor did not think it was funny. And, well, and, and I didn't think it was very funny. But anyhow, so uh, the point is that I use it when when I'm in the, in situations like that. And I can remember, you know, I can remember doing <clears throat> in in orchestras before I had to open the, you know, like the last movement of Tchaikovsky 4 or something, you know. <clears throat> you know, and I'm thinking, well, I'd like to play that note before, but you know what? If I just take a breath and go, <clears throat> that's where it is. That's the horn is just the amplifier. This is yes. this is where where things are happening. So I don't think I don't think that the problem, but a lot of people, that's why we brought the classic back, because a lot of people like the feel of the brass and they like the feel of uh, of putting it in the horn and not, not not on the horn. So but I think the more important thing is that it's at the same place with the exactly. new. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And for young students, especially in the uh, lower brass, you can uh, make more resistance so that they can learn how to buzz into resistance. Yes. Um, and that's another big fallacy, I think, in the brass world. And I think it's probably a lot in in in, in the UK. I mean, the way they play with su such a beautiful dark sound and, and the whole conical approach, if you will, you know, uh, that I think that's why the burp has not, it doesn't resonate too much maybe with those people, but because they think that if, if you're, if you are creating resistance, you're going to ruin your sound, and that you're, you know, you're not going to get that big lush sound. That's and I true. don't, I don't think it's true either. No, I don't no, 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 no. Yeah. But for me, yeah. it was really hard to adapt here in the UK to play. Yeah. Because our conception in Portugal is is uh, much more based in American and French school, maybe. So uh, different, different. Here they have the German uh, dark, big sound and and right. that fat thing. Uh, it's totally yeah. different, but I, I love the burp and, and especially to warm up, uh, for example, uh, we have a lot of troubles, I, I think is every, especially trumpets, because it's too loud and they don't want you to be warming up. And so right. you just put your buzz there. And for example, you are talking about the resistance, but that that little uh, plastic that that you control yes. the resistance, if you want, if you want right. to show them. Yes, it, yes it, right there. It, it also can make you uh, make the sound a bit quieter if you close it. Yes. So, which True. helps you if you really want to warm up really quiet, you just close the holes and, yeah, and it can be bad. Yes. And, and it's awesome. It has a lot of, a lot of uh, things. I, you, uh, on my book, on my method, I have one trumpet method that I've done. And I talk about the burp in the beginning to all my students. The uh -huh. burp is the only tool that allows, I just never tried the, the butt. The, um, oh, the, the breathing. Open. Yes, uh, I, I, I think it's awesome the idea, and and everyone should have one. But here is not for sale at all in the UK. I couldn't find it, so yeah. I, I never got one. But but the burp is the only thing that I started. I used to start my day on the burp when I had that problem, right? Mm -hmm. and so buzzing, doing stamp that exercises that are on the book, then yeah. going to the horn. If I went to the horn and something was wrong. I used to take the horn out. Let's go to the burp again and try to find where the problem is. And I could feel if were my lips, if, if was my breathing, my tongue on the burp and on the horn not. And people say, but why not? Because on the horn you are playing. You are you are you are taking care of other things already and sound and and on right. the burp you are just focused on that on that right. feeling and that face that yes. you talked about. And I think yes. that man, is 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 incredible what you done. Uh, yeah. I know you have new products. Uh, talk now what you're going to say, and then I will ask you about the other products you have now. Okay. Uh, let me give you uh, one other quick thing about the burp that uh, that is not in the stamp book that I that I like to use. I like to use it with sirens. I think I think that we have the advantage when we're buzzing of playing, making every sound between quarter tones, half steps, you know, microtones, whatever. So. If you if you practice a siren and can keep it resonating,
So within that is every note that you want to play, right? So if you have that same energy and then you add fingers to that, right? And then you play on the horn the same way. It's going to be there. So uh, yeah. there's, you need, if you get creative about the use of it and, and when if you really understand what it shows you, it's, it's an incredible tool that way. Um, and then you, and then you take it into whatever you're playing, whatever you're working on. Uh, you know, I tell my students, okay. if you haven't played your burp in the last five minutes, you're probably wasting your time. Because if you're working on, on, on a Charlie A etude or something, and there's an interval that's not coming out, what are you doing? Are you gonna keep practicing that interval 20 times, 40? I hear exactly. students, it's exactly. like, why are you doing that? It's not gonna get better, you know? It's like hitting your head against the wall and hoping the wall falls down. No. Think and go and go. Wait a minute. Take a step back and figure out another way to get yes. around the wall. You know. So that, that that I just wanted to add that little little thing. Um, no, that's true. That's true. And uh, one other thing that I want to say. I interview everyone here uh, uh, on this channel and every kind of brand. Uh, but I, I always and people knows me. I always defend what I like to defend, and I'm really straightforward. And is one other tool that people try to make similar with the burp that is so you fit it on the lead pipe you know but then is a hole on the metal where you put the mouthpiece yes and yes. one of my students came to me with that and i i'm friend with a guy that builds that uh i have to say here but i want to ask you if you have the same opinion not because you, you are a suspect because you are the owner of the burp uh, right. it's not the same why because the burp has a box like a lead pipe so it allows you to have that resonance and that a bit louder resonance to, and the other one not the other one you just so the other one doesn't have this right you know I right. mean you, you you have the shank like this totally open and you are just blowing it so right. for, for what do you want that right do you yeah. know do you know what yeah. I mean do you know what yes. I'm saying All yes right. and, and so, the, yeah. Uh, so Why is important the, that resonance of that little box you you have on the bird? Right. So I think the uh, um, I think it's a fallacy. It's it's uh, to think that that we that we don't want to have resistance. Uh, we play in the resistance. The resistance course. is is part of what we do. I mean, it, it is as anything. That's how they make the sound. So so to practice something that's open is you know. I don't think it's going in the right direction. I think it takes you, it, it, it blows things apart. It, it doesn't doesn't create the place where you do have to create the resistance, which is here in a way with the air. And you certainly don't want to create any air resistance. So this exactly. has to be open and, and you want to learn how to buzz into resistance. And a lot of people like, oh, you know, the, it's like, you know, if you play a Monet trumpet and you have this wide open instrument and a wide open mouthpiece, oh. And you sound great for five minutes. Excuse me, I have prejudice, but I don't think that instrument is necessarily for everybody to use. It, you, and you it's have to not. Be really, no. you know, it's a very uh, demanding uh, instrument, and and uh, I think most people, frankly, can't handle that kind of thing. I think you need to learn to play into the resistance, and that's really where you get the 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 buzz and the resonance of the sound in the resistance. So. That's exactly. my answer to that. Exactly, yeah. and 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 that's that's why I'm asking you because I have the same opinion, and it's really good to know because all the teachers will watch this, and and most of them in Portugal, in the university, in the conservatoire, all of them use the burp. It's really used a lot in Portugal, and no, it's, it's nice it's to hear. <laughs> yes, good. Since I was a kid, everyone goes to the conservatoire. You need a burp. The teacher straight away tells you you need one, so it's really good. Um, Mario. You have more products um, now in the market that, that are new things. They are not new concepts, but you have oils now, you have breezes. Uh, wh what else do you have? And please, where people can find the bat in Europe, if if that's possible? Because in Portugal, for here in England, it's easier to order from there. 
But yeah. in Portugal, if you order something from America, I mean, for example, the bat if it's twenty dollars, they're gonna pay forty dollars more just on yeah. the duties when it gets in Portugal. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's impossible. Well, we do have a Spanish distributor, and I'm trying to think of the name of it. I'll get it to you later. I can't remember right now, but there is somebody no, there from Spain and Portugal who should be putting it in the stores. So the store right. should be able to get it. The bat uh, as well. And the bat as well. Yes. In, in fact, the bat, the, uh, the bat has, um, which looks like this, the bat, it, we actually have the instructions in Spanish also. Um, Awesome. for the breathing and all the stuff with the, with the bat. And I awesome. think the bat, I, I personally, when I came up with the bat, of course, I always have a lot of passion about my, my products and my things, because I think I don't, uh, I really, I don't think um, in terms of a, um, uh, what, um, a high end capitalist. I, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a lot of money off of it. I really think they help people and, and students and things. So, uh, and I was always surprised that, that everybody thinks they know how to breathe. But I think when you wear this every day, I'm going to send you one too, just for fun. And if you wear it every day, all of a sudden you go, whoa, when I start to do that, I don't, I'm not even conscious of taking a breath and expanding and engaging. So that's one thing. So uh, the other stuff, the oil, the world didn't need any more valve oil, but we have the only stuff that's made from plants, plant-based. That's what I'm yeah. asking, exactly. Yeah, exactly. so it's it's a green product. They take uh, the residue from Brazil, actually. They take the residue of sugarcane. Um, they create right. a, a carbohydrate, a, a hydrocarbon, I think it is. Yes, yes, and, yes, yes. And that becomes the basis for 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 the for the lubricant. And I went to a place here locally and told them, "This is what I need. Can you make something?" And they said, "Oh, they thought it was fun because they were making stuff for airplanes." And now they're making little things for trumpets. So it's a very good, and the oil lasts forever. So it's a very bad marketing tool, you know, because uh, we don't sell as much because it, it lasts a long time, but it's very economical. Um, and that's cool. Uh, so we do oil uh, and slide grease and lube. And there's a new one for trombone that we made from the same material that people really like. Uh, and then uh, the latest thing, well, then I have a, a little CD that goes along brass uh, burp and the, and the basics. And if people can't find it in the country where they are, they shoot me an email and we'll find a distributor for you. We'll get someone who you can talk all to. Right. I will share all your details with the interview anyway, later on YouTube and Facebook. So okay. people can follow. And then, and then the last thing, the latest thing is this, uh, with this COVID thing, you know, it's just been a, a really challenge. And I, I have some nonprofits that uh, are helping create relief aid for musicians, especially jazz players. And, uh, and so we've, we've distributed a lot of funds from, from burp sales and things. Um, but I thought, and, and uh, I went out and tried some of the, the bell masks that are out there and I frankly, I could not make the notes come out when I put that thing on there, you know, they were just covers for the bell. So yes. I started experimenting and I came up with this plan, which is uh, you put Velcro in the inside of the bell and then you take this material and this material is, is from a company that makes face masks. Okay. They're called right. Filthy, F-I-L-T-I. -F and they make this incredible three three layered material that's got a nano fabric inside of it. And it's right. very, and the efficacy of the filter is like 93%, something like that. Yes. But when you play on this, I can actually play, you know? <laughs> You can make the notes come out. Yeah. And, and it doesn't change the sound too much as well, which is good. Exactly, exactly. And then we also, because a lot of people said the va the spit valve, right? So we oh, make yes. This, so we I make was about to ask you that. Little, uh, uh, it's like a, you, you strap it on, there's a sponge inside, you go all day, you play, nothing goes on the floor. Even after this is all over, I hope maybe some people will, so your wives won't yell at them about putting spit on the floor, you know? Well, that's so, that's exactly, that's really useful, the one for the spit, because sometimes yeah. it's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
awesome. <laughs> All right. So, How are you? so that's that's what we got. That's awesome. My pleasure. Let, let me out. Uh, uh, wait, your connection just got bad for a second. Let me okay. make sure we are. The best. Okay, uh, Mario, do you have? Let me just ask you now a personal question, personal, professional, but personal, as if I'm, yeah. I'm interested in, in learning from you a lot. Um, and do you have any kind of uh, book, method, compilation from your exercises that you use to your students that, that we can buy or that you can share with people to learn mm. your conceptions? <sighs> That's a good question. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, okay. But I'm working now with uh, uh, a friend, um, Michael Zonshine. Zonshine, I don't know if you know him, but he's he is yeah, helped, yeah, yeah. For, well, just from from Facebook. Yes, he, he helps uh, uh, Tom with the stamp stuff, and he helped a lot of people. And he and I are friends, and he thinks that um, I have something called the first thirty minutes that I've worked on, uh, that I uh, have compiled. And I'm happy to send you out a sheet of it, but he thinks we can break it down into little smaller things. And maybe, really? uh, I don't Let's think see. a book is, is there, but I think there might be something like that, which would be a compilation of short uh, one, two minute, let's focus on this kind of things. And that's what I'm working on now that I hope I can. All right, that's, that's awesome. Because we'll, we'll help a lot of people that wants to, to use the burp as well properly. You could, you could have some sections. Uh, yes. Yes, and of course the stuff that's out there, the uh, you know, the the one on the website, the YouTube bat and the burp, that that, that that's got most yes. of my stuff on it, where I lie on the ground and play with the trumpet and all that crazy stuff. Yeah. I saw that. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so. Awesome. Uh, all right. Louise, I this has been this is so much fun, man. Um, to talk to well was for me it was an honor i'm talking with you and i can't believe it because some years ago i was just looking at you and learning so <laughs> internet is as this and finally i got my career back as well thanks so God. you're playing all but the time so now to... well yeah 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 that's that's my job now and Great. i just won the, the the bronze medal at the global music awards now uh, so was Great, a big man. help well, yeah, so and I'm a jazz player, as you were saying, of course, things are not easy for us now. But so I just decided to do this channel on the time when the quarantine came to help people that there's no opportunity to, to contact people like you at all. And I yeah. now I have. So I want to give them for free this opportunity to, to learn from you because they're going to watch this and they're going to be. Uh, and I, I think it's awesome. Because this is well, history and they are memories. And yeah. we, man, you are one of the greatest ever and I'm just talking with you here. So well, that, for me, that means a lot. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I uh, as I always have, you know, music has allowed me uh, to do so many great things and play with so many great players. Uh, I, I'm just really, I have a lot of gratitude for that. And, and at this point in my life, you know, it's all about every day. It's for me, it's a way to give back. So uh, when you said, and the way you put it out there, I thought, well, this is anytime, you know, and you, you come up with some other way of doing it and you want me to participate, you just, you just call me and let me know. I will, uh, we and, will make a master, we will make a master class with Tony. Tony Plog. That'd be great. Uh, but, uh, and probably Alan Vizuti again. And I want probably the three of you, but in a Zoom conference with a lot of people here watching us and talking with us. And we'll be different. We'll be That's different. Cool. But we will, keep, we will keep in contact. I played with Alan uh, in the studios and uh, got to know him pretty well. We, he's a wonderful guy. I interviewed him about three weeks ago as well. Man, he's mad. He's, he's <laughs> mad. mad. <laughs> Yes. I don't know how you got that, that thing, but all right. Yeah, Mar he's... Mario, thank you so much. God bless you, brother. Thank really. you. And he's a number for me. Thank you so keep, much. Keep in touch, man. Okay. Love. We will. We will. We will. God bless you. Take care.